Hello, it's Scott Manley here, back with another round of Deep Space updates. My notes actually says January 15th, but obviously we didn't get around to that because of a giant island explosion. We'll talk more about that later, but we are going to open with the first launch by SpaceX this year. It was the Transporter 3 launch. That's a rideshare mission, and they had 105 satellites in total on that, including 44 Super Doves from Planet Labs, who of course have been very useful in the last few days. There were 21 Pocket Cubes by Alba Orbital, who are based in Glasgow, where I pretty much come from. These are really tiny CubeSats that use 5 centimeters instead of 10 centimeters as their primary dimension. Um, there were three different companies sending synthetic aperture radar satellites up. There was two from ISI, two from Capella Space, and one from UMBA. Um, a lot of the satellites actually came from subcontractors who bought like a, a section and then sold that capacity onwards, you know, like, and again, Alba Orbital is a fine example of that. But I think uh, D-Orbit is an interesting one because they have their ION CubeSat carrier. It was deployed into orbit and now it's going to fly around and independently deploy the CubeSats that it's carrying. And then it will also have payloads that are basically permanently attached to the spacecraft. Uh, yeah, I think the largest satellite is a Ukrainian Earth Observation satellite. Um, so that's interesting. But yeah, so this launched into, you know, SunSync orbit using their, their usual dog lag maneuver. And it meant that it performed a return to launch site landing. This is the 10th uh, landing of this booster, by the way, which is the NASA booster, the one that carried Demo 2. It's very hard to read that warm logo these days with all the uh, with all the suit over it. And somebody also pointed out that during the landing, because the landing site is so close to Blue Origin's manufacturing facility, pretty much nobody was there. They had to take the you know few hours off of work so that SpaceX could launch, which is an interesting dynamic. But yeah, the other launch that happened in the US this week was Virgin Galactic, um, and yes, they launched like seven satellites for. Um, you know, Polish and US groups. Unfortunately, the live stream was an absolute mess. It was great they had the sign language interpreter that worked. Very, I think that's great. But yeah, their feedback, their their you know um, data was not coming down particularly well. They did eventually switch to telemetry. That was good. The camera was just awful. Like, and there's this bizarre moment in the stream where the commentator, who's clearly reading from a script, says, you know, basically, look at these amazing views you're seeing from the camera, whereas the camera is like delivering postage stamp, low resolution quality imaging. You can't see anything. It's unfortunate, but thankfully the mission was a success, and that's great, except that Wall Street didn't seem to think so, and their stock price dropped, which is bizarre when you think that a week ago, showing off a fake rocket in the middle of New York caused their stock price to go up. I don't understand the stock market. Anyway, uh, the other launch that happened this week was the Long March 2D carrying a Xi'an 13 satellite that launched on January 16th. So we don't know what the payload is. You know, they're, they're classified. They're usually used as tests, uh, you to test technologies. We do know it went into a sun-synchronous orbit, and therefore it's probably an Earth observation payload of some sort. Uh, so from the new launches, we talk to the end of launches coming in sight. Uh, Krunichev will stop production of the Proton rocket. This is the company, you know, the Proton rocket is an absolute stone-cold classic launch vehicle that has been flying for you know, over for like 50 years now. I think it must be about 50 years. Wow, I've got to figure this out. But yeah, you know, because it's like this old rocket that uses hypergolic propellants, um, you know, they've been trying to sunset it for a while and replace it with Angara. So they're, they're going to manufacture the last four this year and then the production line stops. So there's 14 rockets. Well, there will be 14 rockets left like that. I don't know all the payloads, but I do know that later this year, the Proton should be used to launch the Rosalind Franklin rover to Mars in September of, of this year. Um, elsewhere, the Korean launch vehicle, which there was a failure last year, we finally got some reporting of what actually went wrong. Uh, as you remember, it launched well, the second stage went off, and then it lost pressure and failed to reach the velocity needed for orbit. And now it's turned out that there was a design flaw that as the uh, acceleration on that upper stage increased the buoyancy of a uh, helium tank inside the oxygen tank, 
increased and it broke its mountings and uh, broke the side of the tank and you had a pressure loss. And if this sounds familiar, it's because exactly the same thing happened during SpaceX's uh, CRS-7. That was uh, one where they got a, they had a strut which failed way below its expected tolerances. So uh, I'm presuming that Korea is going to make some redesigns to make sure this doesn't happen now that they've identified it. Uh, another sort of disaster that was where well, we had a, an update on was the breakup of the Yunhai-1 satellite. Uh, so that satellite was launched by China in September of 2019. And in March of last year, it had a collision, I think March 18th. And we weren't quite sure what was ha happened or what caused it. People said it was probably space debris, but it's only just been confirmed by the you know, 18th Space uh, Control Squadron. I, it, you know, the guys that do space traffic control, they said that there, they had identified a small piece of debris from a Cosmos launch in like 1996. So this was a Russian satellite launched in a Zenit 2 launch vehicle. And it's interesting because the piece was too small to track reliably. But they had tracked this object enough that they could figure out that that was likely the object which hit this satellite and caused a debris cascade as a result. Um, so this object is probably, I mean, I'm holding up my fingers about this. It's probably one to 10 centimeters in size. You know, you can't really tell. It may be a radar reflection you're getting back. And sometimes it can be hard to tell just how that big that object is from that. Another sort of interesting side of this is that since that event happened and we saw the debris shoot off it, there have been amateurs who have looked at the satellite and seen it operating, like see it behaving as if it's controlled and potentially still working, maybe just missing a solar panel on one side. That's kind of fascinating. But yeah, no, there's no, been no official Chinese agency commenting on whether the uh, satellite continues to work. I, yeah, very Interesting, yes. Okay, everybody wants to know, uh, always SpaceX, Boca Chica. I mean, yes, things got built. The coolest or most interesting or most, let's say the most eye-catching thing that happened this week was another test of the chopstick system that moves up and down the tower and pick, is supposed to pick up the booster. Obviously, they need to test this thing moving with some weights on it. So they use these big balloon type bags that are designed to basically carry, you fill them up with water and they provide ballast. Now these come in like 20, 30, 50, 100 ton variants. And when that thing is moving up and down with these, yeah, those look like very pendulous, you know, sacks of water. Look, I'm sorry, all I see is truck nuts for space hardware. Uh, I mean, maybe that's just because like, you know, Texas or something. Uh, so yeah, they did this test, they moved up the tower, they showed that it can carry hundreds of tons of mass. There may have been some sagging associated with it. They'll probably look to see if that's within expectations. We might see future tests, we might see changes to this design. But again, any actual launch is still gonna be predicated on the FAA and possibly other agencies clearing the area for you know, upgrading from a Falcon Heavy style rocket to a Starship class rocket. Um, another test that happened a few days ago was the third flight of Strato Launch's ROC aircraft. Now Strato Launch are no longer in the business of launching rockets into space, but it's still the widest wing span aircraft in the world. Therefore, I'm sort of interested in it, yeah. So this was the third flight. It flew for about four hours, 20 minutes, and they took it up to like 24,000 feet. Um, it only flew at an airspeed of 180 knots. And the reason is they still are testing the landing gear on this. So previous flights, they haven't really folded in the landing gear. They, they started that on this one. So they folded in a section of the landing gear and then folded it back out just to verify that they will be able to land, right? So, you know, this is a big thing. They don't want to find out there's problems with all of the landing gear. So they're working up to this. Um, but yeah, ultimately this is supposed to carry hypersonic test vehicles called the Talon. The Talon A, uh, you basically bolt your experiment onto their test vehicle and figure out that it gets very hot when it flies very fast. Um, now, um, 
So in the last week, there was a paper in Nature, which is a big deal for space medicine. So the the analysis, well, basically the, the headline is that hemolysis conti contributes to anemia during long duration space flight. So what is hemolysis? Hemo lysis means like the breakdown or suicide or, or death of cells. Lysis is cell death. Hemo implies blood. So this is your red blood cells dying. And they start, they had basically ran this long uh, test program with uh, over a dozen astronauts over six months in space. And they figured out a way to monitor blood cell creation and therefore blood cell uh, death. And so they noticed that in space, your human body has much higher rates of uh, death of red blood cells. Now, we're still not sure exactly what mechanism causes that. Like, is it something about the atmosphere? Probably not. Is it something about being in zero G? Possibly. Very likely. This is something that needs to be sorted. And it does mean that people that uh, have like issues with anemia should be screened a lot more carefully if they want to fly in space. And this is obviously, we're going from the case of astronauts where you're recruiting the best of the best to space tourists where you're recruiting the richest of the richest and therefore there's different medical concerns on either side. But this is a big deal to find this very basic effect on the human body. And now we come to the James Webb Space Telescope segment of this uh, production. Yes, we've obviously been following this even before its launch, but right now it is coasting upwards, getting very close to its Lagrange point. And its velocity is now actually slower relative to the Earth than the speed of jet planes, right? That's kind of wild. People have been asking me, why does the JWST slow down as it's going away? And look, the obvious answer is it's climbing out of Earth's gravity well towards this Lagrange point. And it's like if you're going up, you're coasting uphill, you're slowing down. You see, they wanted to throw this spacecraft out so that it would sit near this Lagrange point. It's like rolling a ball uphill so that when it reaches the top, it has zero speed. And that's what's going on here. Um, but yeah, look, the really important thing that's going on is mirror alignment. So the mirrors are being adjusted, brought into alignment, so they form one big mirror so that... Um, you know, you get really good star images. And you do this with like a reference laser, an interferometer, and a set of motors in each of the mirror segments that adjust the position until uh, they get to where they're supposed to be. There is a fantastic page on the JWST site where you can actually look at the positions of every single mirror to see how close they are to their final. And if you look at this, you'll notice that two of them are very much lagging behind. Uh, I mean, this is hardly a race. As I pointed out, these motors move with all the speed and swiftness of a blade of grass growing. They would make uh, snails look extraordinarily fast. But the two that are lagging behind, that is because they actually discovered flaws in them before launch. Not flaws in the mirrors, flaws in the motor system. So they, they have a set of sensors and the sensors work together to provide very accurate readings. And in these two mirror segments that aren't quite right, the sensors have lost, or the sense they've only lost, they've lost one of the sensors. So they can't, they have come up with a way to figure out how to get these into position, but they want to get all the others in position first and then they'll do the follow-up. Basically, this was a problem they found in the vacuum chamber and they looked at the process of what it would take to take the thing apart put new ones in, get them working. And they realized it would set them back by such a long time and that they had a process, it was a workaround. So they basically launched with not 100% functioning hardware and hopefully that will be fine. Otherwise that person uh, that made that decision is gonna feel very bad. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's unfortunate. But look, it's looking that it's good right now. Um, so as we spoke right now, um, there's literally a meeting right now at NASA, the Human Exploration uh, and Operations Committee meeting. And this is, you know, Kathy Luders and all the important people basically talking about the Human Spaceflight Program. And this, it's all public. Um, so there'll be probably more updates on this next week. But right now it looks like Artemis launch has going to be towards the end of the March launch window. But I'm going to say more likely the April launch window. 
but uh, otherwise we are getting close. Um, the International Space Station has officially had a life extension to 2030, although that is the White House stating that, and you know, you've got the rest of government that might disagree for some reason. Uh, that does mean, now that we've got a new date on that, that the commercial LEO destinations program will have to be up and running to a point where they can transition in about 2028. So yeah, those are those are a few things. There's other roadmaps and stuff being laid out that we'll uh, probably talk about in the coming week. Also, in the last few hours, NASA has launched another crowdsourced technology campaign. I've covered a couple of these in the past, like the Space Poop Challenge and the Venus rover that was designed on clockwork stuff. So this is called the Waste to Base Materials. And they're, what they're looking for is, you know, technologies, well-designed, you know, researched proposals to reprocess waste into useful stuff. And waste can include, you know, and in general stuff like, you know, trash, um, you know, fertilizer from waste food or um, human poop. It can be wrappers or foam, like all sorts of stuff. What can you do this? Well, instead of dumping it, wouldn't it be great if you could, say, take those polymers from the foam and the packaging and, say, turn it into 3D printer food stock? Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of ideas out there. And the whole thing is that you can submit something, you can design it, lay it out. And if your proposal looks good enough, there's a good chance of, of winning a prize. And then, of course, you know, you get to continue working on your idea, which can be a, a really cool way to get forwards in your career. And finally, yeah, back to that uh, story I sort of started with, uh, the island of Tonga, which has been massively affected by a huge volcanic eruption, which was easily visible from space. Um, so as of right now, communications with the island are coming back and we're getting reports on the state. Everything's a mess. There's volcanic ash all over things. There are a lot of coastal sites have been damaged. Some islands were completely overrun by the tsunami. Uh, there have been at least three deaths reported on the main island, but there are a lot of smaller outlying islands where we haven't necessarily got any communications back. Satellite photographs have shown that some islands have been basically overrun. Uh, there's layers of ash on top. Some structures are completely gone. And I hear that they're trying to get aid supplies out, relief supplies out to make sure that, you know, this current crisis doesn't go from bad to worse, but they can't land aircraft on the runway this time at this time because there's volcanic ash over it. There's also concern because the eruption is somewhat ongoing and that does make it a bad idea for aircraft to fly because volcanic ash can get into jet engines and melt and gum up things. This is a problem that's happened in the past where engines have shut down. There was a famous case of a 747 which became a glider for a while after flying through a volcanic ash cloud, uh, cloud near Indonesia. But yeah, I I'm hoping that this situation doesn't get worse. I'll be following it. But uh, yeah, that's my Deep Space update. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.